we talked about who meets the first requirement, the advanced degree, bachelor's degree, or you've worked not just five years with the bachelor's, but you've worked 10 years in your field and you've demonstrated. Now let's talk a little bit about what that proposed endeavor uh, might look like. Absolutely. Let's take a step back in terms of just general context. Um, this is something that I always say to my clients. The United States is really, you know, I think this is no surprise to anybody, really uh, selfish. It's a really selfish country. And that shows in immigration law, because in immigration law, you know, every at the end of the day, every visa category, and particularly this visa category, is really asking, what are you bringing to us? What is the benefit that you're bringing to us? So when we talk about a, an endeavor, and particularly when we talk about an endeavor that within the context of, or at least within the angle of national interest, what they're really looking for is what are you going to be bringing to our society? So I think the, the national interest waiver category is generally used for, as you know, we started talking about scientists and you know, doctors and so on and so forth, doing research, doing innovations, doing this and that. But entrepreneurs and investors also bring an extremely high level of or can have an extremely important positive impact in the economy by creating new businesses because new businesses create more jobs. New businesses, they pay more taxes. New businesses, they invest money into the economy, into the local economy. They buy local goods. They rent office space. They, you know, they buy uh, materials and equipment, as well as local business or, or new businesses, depending on the, the field of work, they help U.S. companies grow. And they also train, can help also train other U.S. professionals. And those are, and again, there's no limitation to those businesses, but there is some type of favoritism to businesses that are either, that are generally high employment required businesses that you generate a lot of jobs. And then do you, will you like document the taxes? So say it's a, um, a healthcare related business, you're creating a home care business, you're going to have 40, 50 caregivers in the first two years. Are you documenting like the payroll tax of like 6% of their paycheck that you as a business owner is paying to the government? Will you include that as part of the business plan in your analysis? Oh, absolutely. As I said earlier, you know, the, the EB2, and I'm not going to say this as a requirement because in this category, there are actually, depending on once we have a business that is set up and prepared to operate, uh, is in many cases already enough. However, once we have, a, and, and now I'm speaking to the clients that are already in E2, already have E2 visas that are op, have been operating in the United States for some time, already in L1 businesses that have, or L1 visas that have already also been operating for some time. Once we have a history of all the investments they have made, all the taxes they have paid, and all the people that have hired, and all the, the contributions they have made to those people's salaries, now we can use all of that as very concrete proof of very real, very direct, uh, positive economic impact. One of the things that we've been doing, in fact, I, uh, you know, this is from, from my expertise in the EB-5 world, but the EB-5, they used this multiplier uh, formula called the RIMS-2 multiplier, which is an, you know, sort of it calculates the indirect impact of every dollar that an individual is investing in the United States. So, you know, money that you're spending in your business and in buying certain products and certain equipments, not only is that having a direct impact, obviously direct positive economic impact in whoever you're buying that, those products from, but also an indirect impact and an indirect job creation of everybody down the, the supply chain line that had to create those things for you to buy them. So between the direct job creation and the indirect job creation, all that accumulates to very real, very you know tangible, positive economic impact. So like, so like you have the jobs, but say it's a, a marketing consulting agency and they're going to allocate 200K a year to AI uh, technology to support their clients. Like, is that something that would maybe help towards the NIW? Potentially, yeah. Because, you know, once again, we'll, we'll, we'll run those multipliers and we'll see sort of what are all the other jobs that have to be created for even that technology to exist? Um, or not only that, what are other jobs that will be created once that is provided to their end clients um, as, you know, the, as the service or the product that you will be selling in the United States? And all those things, I mean, really, from top to bottom, you add up all those jobs and, you know, your, your typical 
whether it is a, you know, like a, a franchise, a coffee shop, a restaurant, uh, a gym, um, or, you know, some type of manufacturing plan here in the United States. And it doesn't have to be massive, but any type of new business that creates jobs, not only are we calculating very, the direct jobs that, you know, the individuals that you actually actively hire in your company, but also the jobs that are indirectly created by everything that you're buying and everything that you're producing. You know, one of the things that we talk about here, and again, national in scope, it, one of the interesting things about the national interest waiver category, and, and particularly this way that we, have, um, that we have been using, or at least arguing on behalf of our clients, is that there's really no limitation in the type of business that can be, um, the individual can create here in the United States. Um, we do have a preference, uh, I suppose, we and immigration as well have a preference for uh, high employment creation businesses. So a business that creates a lot of employment. So restaurants, you know, uh, manufacturing, uh, service level businesses. If sort. you have to decide between the industry and it being like a scientific industry, like uh, cybersecurity, and they're only going to have two jobs or someone's doing like a random industry, but creating 20 or 30 jobs, what would you choose? Uh, that's a really great question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're... You, you kind of put me like at really at the crossroads. Um, or you want to get I, both. Do both. Do a cybersecurity firm, hire 20 people, make everyone's life easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I will say, you know, sort of like to, to rank, you know, to put in order. I, I do have to agree. Anything that is related to STEM, you know, and STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and medicine. So anything related to STEM, those are going to be eye-popping for the, the USAS officer reviewing the case because those are... Those are areas that we really need, you know, and really looking for those types of talents. Second to that, now we're talking about any type of industry that creates a lot of jobs. So now we're talking about restaurants. We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, certain types of franchises, gyms, uh, manufacturing. Manufacturing is also a big one because it does create a lot of jobs, creates a lot of products. Uh, so those would be, I don't want to say second tier, but a little bit lower down. Preschools, um, home care, doggy daycare. Oh, I mean, these are all mm -hmm. very heavy and intensive um, on the job count. Oh yeah. Uh, we recently had a client that got an approval and they have a, um, like a soccer training academy. Very cool. Um, and interesting enough, they started off as on an E2. They have been, you know, working, managing the business and growing the business as with an E2 visa. And they got to a certain point that their academy has grown so big. They have so many people working for them. You know, they're now they're into social projects and social work with the community. And that becomes really a really great basis for an argument as far as the national impact and the national importance. So, yeah, on that, like if you say you have that type of business like in Orlando, Florida, in Miami, Florida, how do you show that it's like national impact? Is it through the media exposure? And you also have a, you know, how, how do you show that national impact? Yeah, it's it's through that those indirect jobs. It's that indirect uh, national impact. Okay. So, you know, the jobs that you're creating. Uh, and none of that, your taxes, your federal taxes, your federal taxes, your your soul, your state and local taxes, they are being used, you know, directly. Your startup investments and uh, are also, you know, spent locally. However, your federal tax dollars are going, you know, are going much farther. Uh, they're being used everywhere. Uh, the jobs that you're creating indirectly. What's another example? So we had a client who, you know, he did flipping. You know, he did a, a lot of real estate development. Uh, particularly in the South Florida area. Now, a lot of the materials that he bought, he bought from, you know, his local supplier. However, those materials are not local. Those materials came from Tennessee. They came from Colorado. They came from Washington. They came from everywhere else. And other people had to produce those materials in other states. And other people had to transport those materials down to Florida in other states. So now he becomes part of this national sort of chain of material and the big the more he grows the more materials he will need thus not only the more people he will hire in you know within his local community but also more materials you need and those materials are going to be uh coming from elsewhere um so the that indirect job creation and indirect economic impact becomes the a strong basis for an argument that this types of business is not only good you know for the investors not only good for the client but it's good for the country 
It probably helped a lot that you came from that EB5 background because a lot of attorneys in the EB2 NAW space um, are turning clients down because they say it's not a national impact and your business is just localized in this in this area here in Miami, Florida. Yeah, I got to say, you know, as, as one of the reasons why I started a presentation talking about some of the differences between the two visas is because as the EB5 uh, visa category, and again, I don't want to I don't want to talk too many bad things about the EB-5 because for some clients, it is still the yeah, best. Yeah, if you're option. born, well, if you're born in India, born in China, EB-2, I mean, China, China is, I think, four years, India, 15 years plus. So yeah, yeah, you're, you're, this isn't really a great option, you know, especially if you have that $800,000 that you can, EB-5 is current and adjust your status investing in a rural area, you know, now. Exactly. So Exactly. But as the EB-5 category, particularly for the rest of the world, you know, started getting, uh, the processing times got, started getting so lengthy, it really required us as a firm to take a look back and see, well, what do we know that USAS already accepts <laughs> as valid economic arguments? What can we steal from our strategies that, you know, so, so successfully used for EB-5 and apply to our other visa categories. You were definitely because on the forefront there because also talking to attorneys, many attorneys have done EB2 and AWs, but have never done it for an entrepreneur. They've yeah. only done it for a PhD student that's already here in the US that's going to be working on this great project uh, and a thesis with an acclaimed professor. Kind of more laid up layup cases that have had been getting approvals for 30 years with that yeah. category. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's something it, it, it started off with that mindset that, you know, sort of that general mindset that, you know, every the, the common thread between every visa category is that the United States is extremely selfish. Yeah. And, you know, in every type of visa category, lo and behold, there's also there's always a requirement or some argument that of, you know, the Uncle Sam saying, yeah, but it's great that you want to come to the U.S., but what are you bringing to us? What are you what kind of benefit are you going to provide for us? And, and you, you know, see I that, say that with like the modern day adversaries of the U.S., like Iran, they have over a thousand EB2 and AWs yeah. approved every year. So mm -hmm. the U.S. is, hey, you're a top scientist in Tehran. Come here. You're welcome. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We don't we don't want you developing nuclear uh, and, and other activities. In we Iran. want Come you here. here. We <laughs> want you here. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I say I, I put a lot of emphasis on everything, some of the strategies that we stole from the EB-5, uh, from the EB-5 world. However, you know, the, uh, our strategy today, our overall strategy for EB-5 and sort of all the tools that we have in our arsenal um, or rather for the EB-2 NIW come from also other visa categories as well. It comes from the E-2 in, term, in terms of demonstrating. Yeah, it comes from the E-2 in terms of demonstrating, you know, the, the use of the startup funds. It comes from the L1 in terms of demonstrating, you know, the, the size and the structure of, uh, of a team, you know. The of importance of your job, why you, I know that's very important for the L1, EB1C. Why does this executive need to be in the U.S. where the other, the investor visa category is E2, EB5, it's not as important. Exactly, exactly. Again, you know, it's, I, I can't say because the EB2 NIW does have those somewhat strict and very objective uh, background, uh, academic and professional background requirements that does limit to some individuals, but there's still billions of people that have a bachelor's degree and five years of work experience that we can prove. And then once we have that background, then it becomes a matter of deciding, okay, well, what type of business do you want to yeah. invest and open in the United States? And how can we better present that business to demonstrate all of the positive economic impact that that can have in our society? So the reason I put this slide in, and this one gets a little technical, but matter Danasar is, and, and this is actually the real big change. So prior to Danasar, um, matter Danasar is a seminal case. It, become, it became precedent and really sort of the, the roadmap to what the EB2 NIW is today. Prior to that, the EB2 NIW really was a category almost entirely focused for those types of individuals, your, your scientists, your doctors, and your, your you know, inventors, and so on and so forth. post Anasar, it became, uh, it opened up. And, and I don't say it made it easier, but by all means, it allowed for, not only for the presentation of arguments such as the economic impact and the benefit, but it also made it more applicable towards the community, you know, that we're speaking to right now, which are entrepreneurs, 
which are people that are traditionally self-employed. Because again, it allowed, opened up the door for us to make arguments such as the positive economic impact, uh, direct and indirect positive economic impact to society. So a uh, critical case uh, for anybody that is, you know, claims to be well-versed in the, in the EB2 and the W space, um, you know, really should know not only this case backwards and forwards, but also so the, the intricacies uh, of the language in this case and how to use it for our advantage. And that's, that's something that um, we have explored and dissected like a frog, really. The, the next few slides, and, and we can, we already kind of talked about them, you know, here, here's more the technical language and really how it applies. Uh, but, you know, as we said, substantial merits and national importance. Um, how do we prove that? There's very different ways of doing that. Um, you know, if you're a scientist, you can say that you developed, you know, something else. If you created a patent, you can talk about the importance of that patent. If you're a doctor and you create a new way of conducting heart surgery, fantastic. But not only for those people, also for entrepreneurs and investors, if we can demonstrate this significant economic impact. And one other thing that's quite important is that we don't have to, you know, it, it works very well. In fact, it works beautiful for people that are already here in the United States for E2s, with E2s and L1s that have already been managing the business. But for people that are pre-operation, post-registration, you know, post-creation of the company, post-investment, um, but pre-operational, it can also work because the language of the, of the category talks about potential for economic impact, not necessarily uh, a history of economic so unlike EB-5, you don't have to prove over a two-year period you actually created and, and, and kept those jobs. Yeah. So it's a, it's a big difference. It's a big difference. Once again, you know, these are some of the ways. Now, another factor, and this is where it goes back to the applicant's background, uh, is demonstrating how this individual is, is capable of uh, and has the ability to, uh, and as, you know, to use the language here, well positioned to come actually do this in the United States. So the, the really the flow of the argument is, here's this individual, extremely well qualified in their home country, academically and professionally, and, or, you know, well recognized above the, above the, the norm. Here's is his field of work. Is his field of work and what he plans to do in the United States, does that have substantial merit? Will that have a national impact? Yes or no? The second question, the third question really behind that would be, okay, is this individual prepared and capable of actually conducting this business model, executing this business model uh, or this business plan and actually providing such uh, benefit to the United States? And these are the various factors that we can use uh, or that can we, we can demonstrate in order to prove that this individual is actually well positioned to do that here in the United States. One ends up becoming a catch-all, but actually this is where the argument sort of really ties into itself. It talks about on balance. It talks about, okay, well, everything that you showed us, but, you know, on balance, is it better to actually hire this individual instead of looking for U.S. workers? And again, this is where the profile of an entrepreneur and an investor really ties a nice bow on this because there's only one person that is truly and as best qualified to operate your company, and that's you. The argument is not so much that whether there are more intelligent, more qualified, or, or more intelligent, more uh, prepared, more trained U.S. workers. The argument is who is the best person to come execute this business plan? And the business plan is your company. Well, we can have the smartest person in the United States, but even the smartest person in the United States will never be as well positioned, as qualified to manage your company as you are. And again, this is why the, this framework and this strategy, that this legal strategy that we have uh, put together really applies very well to investors and entrepreneurs because it really it concludes that we're not looking for the most qualified individual. We're looking for the individual, the best qualified individual for this specific position, which is managing your company. And that inherently is the individual. All right, so here is some uh, some day-to-day -day stuff, but also very relevant to many clients. Um, you know, we talk a little bit about processing times as well as we talk about, uh, you know, some filing fees 
and also application process. So the official processing times as they are documented in the USCIS website, if you're regular, if you file just a regular processing of the I-140, is six and a half to 17 months. Um, 17 months, actually, I, I do have to say, is on the very, very high end. The overwhelming majority of our applications for AB2 NAW these days are coming in anywhere between the six to eight month mark. So six to eight, six to nine month mark, uh, which again is already a fraction of we're looking into uh, in the EB-5 world and even in the EB-1C world. As of uh, earlier this year, they also opened up the premium processing, the premium processing option for EB-2 NAW, which will guarantee an answer within a 45 period or 45 day period, which again, sort of, you know, changes the whole thing in comparison to some of the other categories. Or here over here on step number two, we talk about the different ways of applying for the EB-2 NAW. If the individual is inside the United States and the EB-2 category is current with a visa bulletin, we can file the application, the step one and step two. And step two is the 485 the adjustment. So right now it's backlog some months. Do you anticipate when the government fiscal year ends, October 1, there's gonna it's going to open up some more slots or and become current? Yeah, we're actually hoping that it will happen sooner. Nice. Um, our, our predictions and our hope is that it will happen sooner. Um, however, you know, with our clients, we're already sort of working on different strategies to keep them here in the United States in legal status, uh, until that category becomes current again, and then we can file the adjustment of status. Well, well. What are some of the non-temporary, uh, ways that they can say here? The E2 visa? E2 visas one, the, um, you know, again, the L1 visas one, if they already have that, uh, that profile. Um, if they don't have that profile, many clients are, and we use this as sort of a bridging strategy, but, you know, they're here in uh, F status uh, or J status, depending on sort of uh, what type of a relationships they have here in the United States. Um, that ends up being the, the preferred route that uh, our clients, we have been suggesting to our clients in order to stay in the United and States. I'm sure it's they're... really case by case, because depending on what your spouse is doing, if she's studying, or he's studying, like. There's going to be, there's a lot of options, I guess, at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's very case by case. Um, having said that, you know, just as a conservative myself, um, you know, if the individual is outside the United States, uh, they can still apply for step one. They can still apply the I-140 at any time. Once that gets approved, then that approval gets sent to the U.S. consulate in their home country. And then, you know, that also gets, uh, they can get processed through there. And I, I, I do like that strategy. Again, I tend to be more on the conservative side because it allows, it creates a possibility that the individual would only enter the United States when their case is fully and finally approved. So, you know, we don't have, there's no risk of being in the United States and there being a delayed and an RFE and so on and so forth. And that eating up their time as a student or as an E2 and so on and so forth. So for individuals that are abroad, they can apply for the EB2. They can start the process of applying and actually apply for the first step of the EB2 NIW and then have that approval get sent directly. And what to are the we conference. talking? Someone, you prepare the petition. What's it take? Two to three months to get everything together? For the EB2 NIW, and this is very much our firm, okay? Yes. I think other firms, they might be quoting two to three months. Um, I do have to say, our applications are quite robust. You know, we're talking, generally speaking, and not to say that quantity over quality, but it's really a, a big mix between, I'll show you, uh, I have a process on my desk and it's the, the box is, this one I'm filing today. And <laughs> so what are we talking, about? five, six months? Yeah. So yeah. We, we predict, you know, with a well-organized client uh, from four to six months is uh, what typically takes a client to get. So you got that, they, get they're going to start, <laughs> start getting everything together, make requirement one check requirement two takes more time working with Raphael. Yeah. And then from the time you submit the petition, say from the time they start working with you until they can expect to have the green card, two years, 18 months to 24 months, what would you I'd say? I'd say 18 to 24 yeah. is uh, is a conservative, realistic and conservative time. Uh, we have we do have some clients and I, I stop myself at saying that, you know, this applies across the board, but we do have some clients that within an eight month eight month period, they went from, you know, signing our retainer to having a green card in hand. Yeah. Uh, so and that's great, but you don't want to, you don't want to have the expectation of that and everyone expect that it's going to be eight months, but there's a lot of non-immigrant categories they can bridge if they want to be here in two months. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely.